We are back again. Where I'm with Susan Sherman, who is a professor of epidemiology and health behavior in society. And she's joined us today at the Harm Reduction Conference to talk to us a little bit more about harm reduction and her work and epidemiology and health behavior in society. So please tell me a little bit about your research on these issues and especially as it relates to addiction and drug policy. Um, so I have to start why harm reduction for mm -hmm. me because that's really important to me. Um, I came into public health, I didn't even know public health existed. When I was an undergrad, I walked by the University of Michigan Public Health Building every day because I lived near it and I had no mm -hmm. idea that that was the public health building. And when I was looking for something that really mixed my sense of social justice, that addressed my interest in social justice, and I lived in San Francisco in the early 90s and was really involved in the AIDS world, um, public health was the answer. So mm -hmm. I quickly learned about it. Um, and I did HIV work in San Francisco and moved to the East Coast to get my graduate training and I wanted to go back to women's health which I had done previously and it was all about drugs and there was harm reduction. So mm -hmm. harm reduction very early on articulated what was important to me about public health. It focused on social justice, it focused on access, it focuses on really meeting the needs of people at all places in our society, people at the margins that we often don't want to see and it really brings them into light and into the fold and oftentimes with things that are very uncomfortable to us, sex risk, drug use, trauma, um, and really challenges, um, scratch that, um, and really allows us to focus on the humanness and the people that we do research with. Mm -hmm. So that kind of has driven my research over the past 15 years as faculty here. Uh, currently, I have a few different, all my studies are related to harm reduction. Um, I've worked with the Needle Exchange over the past 12 years doing a range of issues. We currently, I help do some of the research that um, aided in giving the evidence base for changing the needle exchange distribution policy from one to one to mm -hmm. distribute as a needs based, which is kind of more in keeping with a lots of most needle exchanges in the country. And also, it's been shown that less restricted exchange policies are associated with lower rates of HIV and hepatitis C. You mm -hmm. circulate more clean syringes. So, we currently are about to do the analysis to look at data who the needle exchange participants evaluating this new policy, the distribution policy, needs-based distribution policy, look at who's coming to the needle exchange before and after the policy shift, um, who has, um, how long they're staying, if there are more people that just went once before but mm -hmm. now continue continuity of care, what are other services that they receive in the city. Um, so that's one piece of harm reduction research that I'm doing. I'm also working with a group providing the evidence. Um, there's hopefully going to be legislation put forth by um, Clarence Lamb mm -hmm. in the House um, to look to promote needle exchange, let it be legal throughout the state. So I'm mm -hmm. the researcher kind of in this group of advocates who are working to develop that. Um, legislature and develop it in an evidence-based way. I also have done a lot of work with exotic dancers on the block. The needle exchange became began exchanging syringes with exotic dancers and people who frequented the block in 2008 and since then we kind of quantified the nature of risk, how many women sold sex, how many women um, used drugs to try to understand what that environment was about for the women that danced there. And then the past two and a half years, we've had a study looking at the nature of the risk environment. Um, we've been in 26 exotic dance clubs and we've interviewed women who are new dancers and looking at how the club affects them over time. Mm -hmm. Connected to that work is work I'm doing currently with the police where we are looking at the nature of the police's role in the HIV risk environment of street-based sex workers. So we went mm -hmm. from venues to the street. Um, and we are um, a, doing organizational ethnography now with the police, a lot of ride-alongs, walk-alongs, key informant interviews, um, in advance of developing um, a survey and doing, in advance of starting a cohort of 250 street-based sex workers to look at the types and frequency and nature of their interactions with the police, all the goal to develop interventions targeting the police. Um, to that end, I also am the researcher involved with the uh, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, this great mm -hmm. lead which started in Seattle um, in 2011 on the heels of a lot of community action and community work around disproportionate um, arrests for African Americans um, in Seattle. And so hopefully, lead is being discussed in Baltimore and hopefully it's going to be imp implemented this year in a pilot project and I'm helping to do that evaluation. Mm -hmm. So those are the main things that I'm doing around harm reduction. Just a few. So 
You really bring up a lot of connected issues in terms of social justice and the social determinants of health. I'm interested in hearing from you what you believe the most important problems that something like the Harm Reduction Conference can address through legislation are and how you see them being addressed in the city and the state. Um, so some of the most, some things like um, needle exchange. There have been lots of good victories, I would say, mm -hmm. legislatively in the state of Maryland. The fact that, um, that they're standing orders now for prescribing naloxone and mm -hmm. our really incredible health commissioner who's taken on the issue of overdose, so um, taking it by the horns and really addressing it in a very complex and multifactorial way. That scaling up that thousands of prescriptions have been given out for naloxone, which helps to prevent, stops the effects of an overdose in seconds. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something that the legislature took up with a coalition of a lot of different people who've been who worked on that. Um, the fact that now there's legislation, there are lots of things that can happen legislatively mm -hmm. is the answer. The fact that now there's a potential for a needle exchange to be an option for all counties is really important. And sadly, now that you have people who are dying in random, considered outside of Baltimore City, not random, people who are dying in rural parts of Maryland from prescription drugs um, abuse and also from fentanyl, people showing up in Baltimore City, developing drug habits from wherever they came from, prescription drugs, and then ended up using heroin. All of a sudden, the issue of drugs and overdose, I think, makes people, um, it's a moment that we really can capitalize on to make people realize that it happens to them and not only in inner city Baltimore. So I think legislation has a great, the, you know, has a great, um, the legislature is really important, kind of furthering policies at a statewide level. The other question you asked, ask me again the question about the city. Well, how you see the issues being addressed by the city moving forward? Um, well, I think there's been tremendous, um, there's been a tremendous effort and scale up of the response for just, for just growing, continued growing rates of overdose prevention, really scaling up what we know works with naloxone distribution, um, working with people while they're in treatment before they get out of treatment, training people before they get out of jail because we know that people stopping drug use through jail and um, being in treatment are two of the biggest risk factors for mm -hmm. fatal overdose. So having our eyes wide open and looking at the reality of the situation going forward even more aggressively, potentially having a conversation about safe injection facilities. That's mm -hmm. something that um, happens throughout Europe, has been an insight that is a safe injection site in Vancouver um, and being discussed in San Francisco and New York right now as well as other jurisdictions. Um, having conversations with the police about alternatives to um, arrest because in so many ways police are really the first responders and mm -hmm. really see so much how drug use affects our society, particularly the members of society with whom I work. So really trying to articulate what joint efforts can be by public health and public safety and changing the respective norms of each of public health and public safety to come up with solutions, um, progressive solutions, that once again our eyes are wide open to the realities of how much drugs mm -hmm. and low-level drugs really fuel a lot of the ills in our society. Sure. Um, in our city. And just coming back to your work in epidemiology, you know, what does the research evidence say about harm reduction approaches to addiction and even to drug-related violence? You know, these are the issues that are facing Baltimore and Maryland now. So what does the research say, you mentioned Europe, about the best approaches? Um, so there's a very, it really depends on what you're talking about. Sure. So needle exchange, for example. Needle exchange um, came about in 1986 in Holland from the Drug Users Union, the Junkabond, and spread like wildfire in the cities that really scaled up. HIV epidemics kept under 5%, like Amsterdam, like um, Glasgow, Scotland, and cities that didn't scale up appropriately, epidemics happened, you know, like wildfire mm -hmm. through uh, injection drug user networks. So there are 25 years of evidence around needle exchange. Overdose prevention, there's a substantial body of literature that shows that when you uh, work with people in various stages, even when they're not actively using, it's really important to get naloxone in their hand, do training, training of their loved ones so they're available. Um, so they're available with knowledge to if they're in the presence of an overdose, for example. 
Um, the evidence around violence, I think safe streets, and you've already talked to Daniel Webster, that's mm -hmm. really not my area of research. But one area of research that I think that isn't often when we talk about violence and drug use is that of sexual and physical violence against men mm -hmm. and women. But that's an issue. Trauma shapes so many reasons why people are using drugs. Mm -hmm. So I think, and there's a really large body of literature. My work is lar largely HIV and STI focused. But there's a very large body of literature to show the in interactions and the association between trauma in childhood and in adulthood and how that fuels addiction and risk behaviors. And our exotic dancer studies of 117 new dancers, women that had done dance less than three months, 30% had, um, had been victims of childhood sexual abuse, 38% were experiencing sexual or partner violence when we interviewed them. So this continues to fuel this type of violence, which isn't often when we think about violence in Baltimore as something that's really insidious, is something that's known in the drug world, but something really, I don't know that it's been effect, it's been approached at a policy level. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you, you bring up, and rightly so, these issues of you know, intimate par partner violence and the kind of broader societal issues. I'm interested in hearing, like, how do we ensure that the dialogue about drug policy, violence prevention, you know, even going so far as to say, you know, as they've done in other places, the legalization of prostitution or you know, the decriminalization, decriminalization of drugs. Um, and prostitution. And prostitution. How do we ensure that the dialogue about these issues is informed by research evidence? Um, well, I think it's important when researchers, it's too late to produce the evidence and expect to bring people forward. So mm -hmm. it's really important to have the right players at the table in advance when you're developing your research questions, whether that be people who are using drugs, whether that be policymakers in the city, whether that be legislators, to really make sure drug treatment providers, people that are friends and foes, to have a conversation to see where um, where there are commonalities to move forward. So I don't feel that uh, that you can have to bring that. It's I think it's too late just to bring the evidence without involving mm -hmm. people in the process. And honestly, I think that's one of the biggest answers, hard as it can be. Great. Professor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thanks.